I'd like to call the August 29th, 2017, the Longmont City Council study session to order. Could we please start with the roll call? Mayor Coombs? Here. Council members Bagley? Here. Christensen? Finley? Here. Moore? Here. Peck? Here. Santos? Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. Can it stand for Pledge of Allegiance? sign-up sheet. Well, first off, is there any, anybody who'd like to uh, make any motions to direct city manager or have agenda items to future council member Peck? Thank you. Um, I had a conversation with uh, the city manager last week, and I, I wanted council's input on it. Um, in light of the prairie dog issue that developers have and not finding places for them, I, I talked to him about the uh, possibility of the city having a prairie dog village, which would, in essence, give us a place where we could actually put the prairie dogs from developers, from the city, from land that we want, using it as an educational center as well, because other cities have done this, where they teach kids about natural wildlife, um, and if we put it in a riparian area, the riparian ecosystem would manage the population for us. Um, so I wanted council's input. Or do you think this is a good idea? And should we direct staff to look at the feasibility of that? Is there any input? Councilmember Christensen. <laughs> Uh, I think it's a good idea. I, th I know that um, um, City Manager Dominguez has uh, familiarity with this and has uh, worked with this stuff before. And um, the idea of driving around golf course and car <laughs> uh, golf carts and uh, hooting at prairie dogs sounds like fun. Um, <laughs> and well, the problem is that we, uh, this is such a growing problem that it would help out some developers who currently have, uh, are stuck trying to deal with this issue. So I think it's a good idea to at least explore. Mayor, can I jump in? Yes, sure. Um, so I've actually heard a similar piece of this conversation from others. Uh, one of the things that we were talking about doing, so obviously, you know, we have um, a landfill, a, a former landfill issue with Prairie Dogs. I went out with Dan Wilford we were looking at some things, talking about the, these different types of options. Um, what we were what we were talking about is potentially getting council out with um, our staff, David Bell, Dan Wolford, to look at some of these sites because one of the things that I learned in, in the trip was that um, depending on where you're looking at, you have other habitat issues related to um, the wild turkey that we have in certain areas or the white-tailed deer, um, and, and so there's a larger view that we have to look at. In addition, I know that David is looking at other sites as potential relocation options. And, and so if I may suggest an option would be is um, we go down that road and meet with council members and go out and go through some of the areas and talk about the uh, different issues we're dealing with. That's okay. just a suggestion. It's up to council. Councilmember Bagley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I mean, we'll see that much longer. I miss you. Um, uh, the, uh, I, I had the opportunity to meet the Prairie Dog people, and uh, what we had talked about, and I, uh, it's similar to Council, what Pembroke Council Member Peck saying, but uh, in theory, if, if I don't, I mean, the idea was um, ask uh, Sun Construction to pay to relocate the Prairie Dogs, the cost not to exceed the cost of extermination. <coughs> which there is a company that would do that. And then during the flood, there was a prairie dog colony, and burrows are available at Sandstone, 
And so you just take the prairie dogs and put them where they were before the flood. And it goes back to status quo pre-flood levels. And that way, it just seemed to me that everybody would win. And in talking with Harold, uh, the only question, though, is um, has the, the new path of the St. Brain, um, because of the turkey and all that other stuff, would that even be possible? But I, I think that that would be fine, because it's not doing anything new. It's just restoring the status quo, restoring the pre-flood status quo. Council Member Beck? Um, thank you. You know, there was a, I understand what you're saying, Councilman Beckley, there was, there was also a pre-flood prairie dog field behind the, uh, uh, park, on Sunset, behind the Parks and Rec building, I think it was. Um, and I had asked Dan Mulford why we couldn't re-establish that as a prairie dog field. And he said that, well, basically because it has been uh, seeded with grasses that are, are are basically for flood mitigation, the root system, and they didn't want prairie dogs eating those grasses down um, to the level that they were before the flood. So having known that and remembering the prairie dog problem we had at the airport and what a huge issue that was, and they ended up being exterminated, and different uh, developments that are going to be coming up, I was just trying to think of a, a way that we could use the ecosystem, use education, um, and take care of our own problem of relocation instead of trying to find, put developers under this horrible conversation that we seem to keep having about who, who's going to take these prairie dogs, who's going to move them, are we going to exterminate them, and, and basically I know that there are other towns that uh, actually make it an education center and uh, teach kids, school kids, etc., about wildlife, about colonization. Um, and I, I thought it would be just uh, uh, something to explore as, as a solution. Councilmember Moore, thank you very much. Um, I also met with the prairie dog protectors, and our meeting didn't really center around where <clears throat> so much as where or why or how. But um, their ask was to have a working group put together to, to decide how to how to manage the city code moving forward. It, so this would be an extension beyond that um, to try to find a location in Longmont. They seem to think that the uh, Rocky Flats area would be a relocation site, but um, that has yet to be proven out too. So I guess that uh, for me, I'd need more education on what prairie dogs require and where, where potential sites could be in Longmont. So if we don't look, I guess we don't. We won't have an answer. I think we should not spend a whole lot of time on it, but. Um, Maybe we should get to city manager Dominguez's suggestion. Maybe we should educate ourselves a little bit too before we uh, move down that path. Yeah, I agree. If we want to tour areas of potential, I don't think we need to make any decisions or give directions on this tonight. But I'd be open to more education and uh, you know maybe a, a city tour in the future. So what we'll do is I'll work with um, David and Dan, um, and they can uh, <coughs> brief you. You know, they can provide briefing on, on what they're looking at, and what they're doing. Um, I know that he's looking into a lot of different options, and we can look at a tour. I also think, that, you know, as a side note, the tour is really good for me because I got to see what they were doing for Resilient St. Brain and how they're using root balls and all sorts of things in the area. So. Um, you know, it gives us an opportunity to let you all see a lot, but also see some of the areas and, and let them talk about the different variables that come into play. Council Member Santos. Thank you, Mark Coombs. I'm reluctant to do this. I just see a lot of pandering. Um, 
but if council would like to do this, I, I would like, instead of having this come back in, in a study session, a regular session, maybe perhaps uh, in, a, in a part of our information items, because the idea of having a park in a riparian area, I mean, we try to keep people out of riparian areas all the time. Um, you don't want, you don't want to disturb uh, those raptors coming in to feed. Um, so if you have tours going on and, you know, like what I heard, golf carts, it really doesn't work. Um, but I wouldn't mind, you know, want to go look at some sites? Okay. Um, but I, I don't see this as a, as a very large problem. And it shouldn't take, as others have already said, should not take up a great deal of our time. We have a packed agenda for the next several months uh, with the budget. So... There you go. Council Member Peck? Well, let's do it in January. <laughs> let's tour in January then. Yeah, I'll work with David and, That'd uh, be great. and, and Dan on this because I know they're doing stuff now. I just don't know exactly what their schedule is. Okay. Um, House type Republican invited to be heard, so uh, Marcia Martin, please come down and state your name and address for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Mayor Coombs and members of the council, good evening. I'm Marcia Martin, 1209 South Emory Street, Longmont. I'm running for city council for Ward 2 this fall. I've been canvassing and asking people what they think. One thing I hear surprises me. Folks think it's a foregone conclusion that the Green Rainbow rel restoration will involve extensive privatization of the land reclaimed from the floodplain, developing both sides of St. Rain Creek. And that's a thing a lot of people say they don't want. Whenever the restoration of St. Rain Creek is discussed, it sounds as if there are only two options. One option is building an Austin-style river walk with jazz clubs and loft apartments and boutiques. The other is to return the flood-proof channel to nature and restore the greenway. <coughs> Economic growth versus environmental protection. That's the way the people I talk to see it. Council has not yet voted on any proposal to my understanding. I, for one, don't understand why we have to choose. What if one side of the creek were restored to pristine, riparian nature? What if its flood walls were sculpted with wildlife runs and hides that allowed the currently severed wildlife populations on the different sides of Longmont to rejoin and intermix once more? But if only one side of the creek were restored, were opened to development, and opened at that only subject to the constraints of a pedestrian flow and a traffic flow study around the proposed development and an economic analysis of what kind of businesses are most needed here and what kind of zoos. What about having a robust public debate on those needs and what if the green re restoration was considered in terms of a well-defined community goal rather than special interests? Surely the goals of every community are prosperity for everyone, social benefit for all, and investment that ensures the future of the community. It won't be hard to find developers for the river. Imposing constraints on them will not stop development. We have a great opportunity to make the Greenway side of the river into a long-term educational process, project for the community. We're blessed with major agricultural universities nearby who could produce a plan for ecological restoration, find grant funding, seed several doctoral dissertations. The work of land restoration, the planting, could be done by volunteers, elders working with high school students, supervised by local experts like the family at Olin Farms. Let's explore our real goals and visions before accepting the wholesale commercialization of the Greenway. Let's lift up Longmont. Thank you. Scott Stewart. Good evening, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Combs, Council Members, Scott Stewart, 229 Grant Street, uh, Longmont. Hey, um, 
I'm trying to take some time and uh, focus on understanding the airport a little bit more and how it uh, how it affects the city and how it's such an asset to the city and and what have you. And honestly, I'm I'm having a hard time with some of these numbers. I'm looking at uh, 2008 reports where it says it had uh, we had six, the the total employment, the economic impact study, total employment was 666, yet the latest one says the jobs are 204, payroll was 17 million, now it's only 9.1 million. I guess we're going to be looking at another economic impact study in uh, uh, probably about another year since it seems to come up every five years. I don't know how they're coming about these numbers. and Maybe, maybe some of these numbers were because of our old manager, our old... Uh, airport manager and but the numbers just they don't work and I'm kind of talking to you because every weekend I'm affected by this I didn't buy an air a house in the influence zone I bought a house in Old Town I face west it's beautiful I like to listen to the birds sing everything is great it seems that in order to make the airport work we have to build the airport and increase the airport when I first moved to to a house that I'm at 16 plus years ago, jump plane wasn't a problem. They were in a little plane. It wasn't a big deal. They brought the otter in, things changed. My fear is that as this airport grows, we're going to affect the people below more and more as we're trying to make this thing into some kind of economic engine for the city. And I'm I'm not sure it's necessary. I mean, look at 200 and something, 264 acres of prime real estate in Boulder. We're searching for good places to build homes and build businesses and stuff, and we're hogging it with with an airport that has trouble meeting its own numbers. You know, there's. I was just informed that you know the part of the numbers for the airport is the cell tower. Cell towers about thirty thousand dollars a year goes into the general fund for the airport. Not for the general fund for the city, but for the airport. And they're having a hard time making their numbers. The, the math just isn't working. And if you talk to members at the airport, they want more money invested, more money, more money, more money. They're not, the math doesn't work. We're, we're, it really seems like we're paying for somebody's hobby. And if this is such an economic engine, you know, what, is Smokers parking their plane there? I heard they're not. Really, this town is great. Schools are great. Businesses are great. We have brilliant minds here. Let's keep focusing on that and stop. Just take the airport for what it is, which is a great place for some affluent people, possibly non affluent people, to enjoy. We got a jump thing that, you know, brings a lot of people in the town. They're just loud with the plane they're using. Thanks. Strider Vinston. Good evening, Mayor Combs, Council, I'm Strider Benston, uh, 951 17th Street. Um, last week I came up here, I was intending to give a eulogy of my friend Dick Gregory, but other things came up and needed to be addressed and I forgot it and it blew away. Um, uh, I would say next to Harry Belafonte and Paul Robeson, he was the best uh, celebrity career freedom fighter we ever had in this country. And um, there's just so much going on. A um, Couple of weeks ago after Charlottesville, the president gave a speech saying there are good people walking with swastikas. Nazi flags and made made no mention of uh, uh, Heather Heyer, who they uh, murdered. Uh, I find that uh, very interesting. Um, what we uh, have at this point, um, uh, I've got the book here, James Hansen's Storms of My Grandchildren. Uh, America's number one climate scientist the last 30 or 40 years. This written in 2009, the truth about the coming climate catastrophe and our last chance to save humanity. Um, 
we got the hurricane in Houston now, and uh, there was a climate scientist from Rice University, which is in Houston, on TV yesterday, and he said, the mere idea to talk about a hundred year flood has no meaning anymore. They've had 400 year floods in the last two years. Um, uh, Hurricane uh, Harvey is uh, the norm now. And if we don't do something about it, we're not going to have a planet left to save uh, for our grandchildren. Um, let's wake up and um, get on board uh, this planet Earth, the blue marble up in the sky. It's up to us. And if we keep playing these political games about how to steal money from uh, people who work for a living so that only the banksters run the country, um, it's the only chance we have left is to address these things right now. And it means politically as well as scientifically. Thank you. Is there anybody else would like to speak at public invited to be heard? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close public invited to be heard and we'll move on to the uh, special reports. Mayor Nancy Rizak of Visit Longmont is here to present. Good evening, Mayor Coombs and Council. I'm Nancy Rizak from Visit Longmont and I'm here tonight to present I wanted to present um, our accomplishments to date since I came on board in 2013 and then our second quarter accomplishments. So one of the main things we have implemented at Visit Longmont is the logo brand and we have the logo brand recognition. We accomplish this through uh, consistent use of that logo in advertising, market, marketing, and merchandise. To date, we've produced over 32,000 of the logo stickers. And we've implemented the development of branded merchandise in our visitor center, so t-shirts, glassware, hats, etc. And then we've uh, established a number of giveaways, pens, lip balm, luggage tags with the logo brand on them. As far as marketing goes, we have a daily <coughs> presence on social media extended to all of the major channels. So Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, uh, Instagram are the main channels that we use. Uh, in 2015, we produced the Visit Longmont video, which many of you have seen. Um, and that was a major accomplishment for us. We get direct mail leads through the Colorado Tourism Office, through our uh, ad in the official state visitor guide, and we follow up with all of those leads with a pretty uh, significant direct mail program. In February of last year, we took over the CTO page, um, so that the Instagram CTO page so we had Visit Longmont featured and Longmont photographs featured for a week on the Instagram page for the CTO. Um, we have become active in the Zagster sponsorship. We have a, a station that we have sponsored as Visit Longmont. And we have partnered with the CTO on blogs and mentions in the official state visitor guide. Last, uh, last quarter, I distributed that to each of you with the pages marked, and you could see that we had over seven mentions in that official state visitor guide. This year, we applied for and received a Recover Colorado Mark Tourism Marketing Grant from Edit, OEdit, um, and that is worth $50,000. So that is pretty significant when you consider our budget is $380,000. And another significant accomplishment this year has been the placement of our visitor guide in the BNC concourses at DIA. We really feel like that has had a positive impact on us. Uh, when I show you the visitor center walk-in traffic, you'll see how that has increased this year over last year and the year before. Additionally, we have begun a visitor profile research project this year. It started in May and it will wrap up in September 
We uh, commissioned RRC Associates out of Boulder to conduct that survey for us, and we are conducting that through intercept surveys, kiosks uh, placed at hotels and attractions around town, and then email, email follow-up survey. To date, we have over 500 respondents to that survey, and uh, I will go into more of the, um, the demographics of those respondents later in my presentation. As far as advertising goes, um, so we contracted with a local publisher, Brock Media, out of Boulder. Um, in 2015, they produced our first visitor guide. They produced our visitor guide in 2015, 16, and 17, and we have con contracted with them to produce the visitor guide for three more years. We have advertised with the CTO, the official state vacation guide, a live magazine, and through their website. And we have created an official map for Longmont, a simple map which shows um, the main thoroughfares in Longmont, a regional uh, map, and then a downtown map. We've also produced the lodging guide, the travel checklist, and the brewery guide, because breweries, as you know, are a main component of our visitor segment. Um, we have advertised in Colorado Life and Colorado Meetings and Events magazines. And then through our contract with the city, we administer the $25,000 grant program. In 2014, that program offered grants to nine organizations. We had over 232,000 attendees and 350 room nights. In 2015, we had nine organizations once again, 207,000 atten 207, attendees and 512 room nights. And in 2016, we had 10 organizations, over 153,000 attendees, and 894 room nights. The drop in attendance there uh, is a result of Boulder County Fair changed the way that they report attendees. And so they were, um, ex they were really reporting more attendees in the previous years. So in those three years, we had a total of 28 events close to 600,000 attendees, close to 1,800 room nights. And if you value a room night at about $133, which annually that's about where we are, we have 200, over $233,000 that's just been generated through the tourism grant program. And that just explains the county fair numbers. Um, so our website, we introduced a new website in 2015, in June of 2015. We were able to get that website created for us for about a quarter of the cost because of our relationship that we had established. Our website today has very robust blogs. I don't know if you're able to visit the website, but we keep up with everything going on in town and um, new businesses, events, etc. Um, in 2015, we added the booking engine to the website. So Jackrabbit is our booking engine vendor and um, people are able to click directly from their website to find out cost of hotel rooms in the area. We've shown an increase in our calendar listing, so the Visit Longmont calendar of events is recognized as the, the event listing in Longmont. Um, we have a 230% increase in uh, events listed in 2016 versus 2013. Uh, we've been fortunate to decrease our bounce rate on our website. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with bounce rates, but um, this is showing that only 1.6 of the visitors to our website go to one page and then leave immediately. In 2014, with our previous website vendor, our bounce rate was over 50%. So you can see how we've improved that. We've also um, increased the number of pages that people visit, 3.8 pages in July, uh, versus one page for the most part in 2014. Partnerships. Of course, we're a member of the Advanced Longmont Partners Group, and we attend monthly meetings there. We're part of the Northern Colorado DMO, DMO Group, so that's Destination Marketing Organizations. Um, so that includes Greeley, Fort Collins, Loveland, Estes Park, Boulder, and Longmont. 
Um, in 2016, in June, we invested in a social media influencers tour. Through that, um, through that tour, we received three Facebook posts, 18 Twitter mentions, and eight, over 8,000 Instagram likes. Uh, we meet with our hotel partners in the spring and the fall of each year. And we attend DMA West, which is the organization that was replaced, uh, replaced DMAI, which I felt was not a good match for our organization. So DMA West hosts three conferences a year, and we attend those. And then Destination Colorado has quarterly meetings, and then their annual trade show, which is uh, geared toward meeting planners in the Colorado market. So as far as our accomplishments in second quarter of 2017, uh, we received three RFPs from Destination Colorado, four RFPs request for proposal from Cvent, and one RFP was not forwarded due to the lack of hotel rooms that were required in that RFP. They were asking for 1,200. We only have 852 rooms total, so we could not even respond to that one. Um, as I said, we have the Jackrabbit booking widget on visitlongmont.org, and our lot, lodging cost per referral at the end of the second quarter was seven, over, a little bit over $7. And we found through um, Jackrabbit that our main states for referrals are Colorado, Texas, Illinois, Nebraska, and California. As far as marketing goes, we do a monthly email newsletter that has, for the second quarter of 2017, that went to over 3,500 contacts. We averaged a 33.5 open rate, 33.5% open rate, and a 17% click rate. So that is customers that actually click on links in the newsletter. We sponsored a social media influence tour, influencer tour with a woman out of northern Colorado. Her name is Heidi, and she has a website called Heidi Town. Um, she has follows, followers from a nine-state region. And as I mentioned, we have the $50,000 tourism marketing grant, war, grant <coughs> award from OEdit. The funds from, from that grant will be used partially for the marketing research project that I told you about with our RIC associates in Boulder, and the remainder of the funds will be used to target market to those feeder markets that we find out from the research are people that are coming to Longmont. So to date, um, as I said, we have over 500 surveys completed. Just some interesting information, our average customer age is 41. Um, they are families with children that are traveling here, they're staying an average of five nights, which is great, and they're staying in hotels for the most part. Um, and they are coming here for events, um, people watching, and breweries are some of the top activities that they come here for. From May through October of this year, we advertised in Colorado Life Magazine, whoops, that's a typo, 30,000 reader, readers, and they have shown interest in traveling to Colorado. Um, we have 640 direct mail leads that came from our uh, advertising in the official state vacation guide. And then we continue to participate in the Arts and Entertainment District, the marketing committee for that, the LDD Block <coughs> Program, Block Captain Program, the Advanced Longmont Partners Group, and the Multi Multicultural Action Committee. As far as our website for second quarter, we had 20, over 26,000 visitors to our website versus about 23,000 in 2016, so we're showing at 16.8% growth there. Our bounce rate, 2.6% um, at the end of June versus 3.43% in 2016. So we're down 40% in the bounce rate, which is a great number. You want to be negative in bounce rate if you can. Um, our average session duration, we sh showed a little bit of drop in that, not anything that we're really concerned about. A minute and 35 seconds this year versus a minute and 50 seconds last year. 
And then pages per session, once again, a minor drop, but we're not concerned about that, 3.90 at the end of June this year versus 4.14 in 2016. And then we are showing 80% uh, over 80% new sessions versus close to 80% last year, so a very minimal increase there. <coughs> as far as social media goes, this is just numbers for um, second quarter of this year. So we started the quarter with 42, 47 Facebook followers, and we ended it with 44, 44 Facebook followers. So a 4.6% increase there. Twitter, 1389 versus 1459, a 5% increase there. And probably our biggest growth has been through Instagram. We um, started with 1129, ended with 1249, so over a 10% increase there. And we attribute that to, we've upped our frequency on Instagram, and so um, we have more followers and we have more people engaged in our photographs. So our tourism grant program, uh, we awarded 11 grants this year. Four of those are new events, and four events occurred in the second quarter. Colorado Tartan Days, the Rocky Mountain Steam Fest, Warrior Playground Qualifier, and the Art of Cheese. So just the attendance in the second quarter was over 8,000. We had 75 hotel rooms <coughs> booked as a result, um, with close to a $10,000 value and once again, we're basing that on average room cost of $133. Year to date, we have a little bit over 13,000 attendees and 140 rooms booked with a value of over $18,000. Um, Lodger's tax receipts, as you may know, uh, year to date, we're up 13.6% through the end of June. We were a little bit concerned that we added new hotel rooms with the Candlewood Suites. We didn't know if that would cannibalize the numbers that we had seen year to date, but as you can see from this, um, it has not cannibalized those numbers, and we think that we're probably drawing some more people from Boulder. Um, definitely with Highway 34 closed in early spring, um, we garnered some traffic from that as well, but we are in great shape year to date. Uh, visitor center walk-ins, as you can see, um, We've seen a gr great increase in walk-ins, especially this summer. And in August, um, we are probably going to exceed 300 walk-ins, which is incredible for us. I don't think we've ever reached 300 walk-ins during one month. So um, our presence at DIA definitely is helping us. Uh, once again, we have the leads that we get from the official state vacation guide. Um, last June, we show a spike in the number of um, leads that we received, and we found that the CTO or whoever we get the leads from um, was actually holding back, and they sent us a bunch all at once, and so that's the reason for that spike in June of last year. Uh, we have begun creating relocation packets because we had a number of people walking into the visitor center who were relocating to the area. And so that has become a main focus for that, for us. Um, and as you can see, our total for the year, I mean, we're only a little bit past halfway, and we are going to exceed last year's relocation packet numbers. And that's it for second quarter. And Visit Longman, I wanted to know if you have any questions for me. Council Member Christensen. Um, a couple questions, but mainly just I think you're doing a, a, a really great job, and especially with your marketing, I love the idea of Heidi Town. It sounds like uh, she's she's found some different places to go, and that'll bring in people. Um, do we? I thought we had a, a shuttle. I remember I called from Washington D.C., and we didn't have a shuttle last March, but they said they were going to have one uh, in May. So Green Ride has started Green Ride. servicing. Okay. Um, currently, help. they are picking up people at their doors, but they are looking at opening a hub on South Main Street, and so that would be where people would park and ride from there. Yeah, and I know we have a, a very nice high-end one too, Black uh, Cat, Black 
nine. Does anybody remember that? Like eight, eight maybe? I, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I don't remember. remember but they, they seem like very uh, nice if you have lots of money. Right. Or it's not that expensive. Um, what is the vacancy rate of our hotels? So we were, um, up until this point, we have been unable to determine that. There is a report that the hoteliers receive called the STAR report. Mm -hmm. And um, up until this point, Visit Longmont has been grouped in with other Colorado because there weren't enough hotels reporting. Um, as of June 2017, we do have enough hotel rooms reporting. We are trying to get that report now. Okay. We want to subscribe to that so we can find out our vacancy, but right now I don't have a vacancy number for you. Yeah, because we're building a lot of new hotels. And, and I was telling um, <laughs> Councilwoman Peck that this is going on across the Front Range. Every single DMO that we talk to is having this same phenomenon. So hoteliers must, must have confidence in uh, the number of tra travelers coming to Colorado because, as I said, they're building up and down the front range. Well, I guess so. In that, the number of rooms we have is the of 852. Does that include include our bed and breakfast? It does. Oh, okay. Yes. Wow. That That's, includes okay. everything. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. maybe we do need some hotels. <laughs> um, I was interested to see what um, your the top referral states were, and I'm wondering if, you know, Colorado is, well, frankly, Texas, Illinois, Nebraska, and California. I don't know. Colorado's much nicer than any of them. Right, and so, in our research, we have found that uh, most of our respondents, 71% of our respondents, are from the Front Range. Mm -hmm. So that could be oh, okay. from Colorado Springs all the way up to Fort Collins and farther north. Right. Do, so, do we do a lot of marketing to New Mexico, Arizona, Wyoming, Kansas, and Utah? Because that currently we have not. Oh, okay. um, but we hope that the results from this marketing research survey will show us where we need to spend our dollars to attract more people. Yeah, because those are kind of natural road trip people. Right. Um, ha have you ever considered getting somebody to send articles into Sunset Magazine? I know that's kind of maybe pedestrian for some people, but a lot of people read it and, and take advice. So um, the CTO has had success in garnering coverage in Sunset Magazine. That's okay. something we hope to pursue at Visit Longmont. We have not done it to this point, but we do hope to do that in the future. Okay. I, I really like all the magazines that you're already in, and I think that's, that's great. I, the one suggestion I would have is that when I go to, uh, most people travel a lot on the weekends, and uh, they travel, uh, they leave work, and they arrive in a town after 5.30 at night. So I have been to a lot of places on road trips, and you, they often have uh, visitor centers that are open until, say, 7 at night. And, oh, okay, on the weekends. And on or weekends. Or on Friday. Yeah. So, okay. If we could figure out a way to do that, I think that would be very helpful. And we have found that up being open on Saturdays this year, because we did have that in good. our contract this year, has benefited us greatly. Yeah. Okay. So good. That's something we're going to so do much forward. Sure. Okay. Councilmember Moore. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. So Nancy, you mentioned a budget of three hundred eighty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Where does that? How does that, just for the education of the public? How is that funded? How do you get your money? It's totally from the lodger's tax. Two uh, two percent. Two percent lodger's, lodger's tax. tax right. That everybody pays when they rent a hotel room in Walmart. Correct. So yep. yeah, for was that like twenty dollars out of every thousand or something like that. So it's not. Is that right? That's right. So I just wanted to make sure, make it make people aware this is. These are taxes paid by visitors to Longmont. That's it's not correct. funded through the general fund of the, of the city. That's correct. <clears throat> and um, so, uh, it, it's a it's an important distinction because it's uh, something that I'm sh not sure a lot of people are aware of. So I just okay. wanted to point that out. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Okay. I don't see any other questions. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you very much. Okay, now we've got Jim Golden to present the 2018 proposed budget and the 2018 to 2022 proposed capital improvement program. Yeah, Mayor, so Jim's going to give you the presentation. Um, we are going to 
um, put the actual budget in your Dropbox. I don't know if Teresa's already done that, but it will be in there tonight mm -hmm. for you all. Mayor Coombs, members of the council, I'm Jim Golden, Director of Finance. So uh, tonight, um, I don't know if you mentioned that the council, your, your copies of the proposed budget will be in your drop boxes tonight. Uh, we are providing you a brief overview of um, the information in the proposed budget, but we'll be following that up over the, the next three to four weeks with detailed presentations. So what I'm going to cover tonight, you will hear more detail on each one of those highlights. Um, you, if you're looking for the details quickly, you can open it up tonight, look at the budget message, and read through there, and uh, you'll get most of the um, uh, highlights in there, and uh, we'll try to bring you some of the more uh, prominent details to you throughout the month, and I'll cover what that schedule will be in uh, um, next slide here or towards the end here so doesn't want to play so. it is. Right. so um 2018 proposed budget is uh, $316.3 million. It's an 11.9% increase over last year's budget of $282 million. Uh, there's CIP projects in the first year, 2018, of $44.3 uh, million. Last year, actually, it's increasing to $60.3 million for 2018. So that's uh, $16 million of this overall increase. We'll be drawing over $19 million of fund balances for either capital projects or one-time expenses. Mayor. The budget includes... Council Member Santos, do you have a question? Jim, can you go back one, one slide? So, 316.332. What is, and I know we're not done with fiscal year 2017 yet, but it's been brought to my attention that, you know, it's an 11.9 increase from the budget of what we approved, but with all the supplementals, what are we looking at? Lisa's going to pull that up. Yeah, I think it's over $400 million currently in, in 2017. Right. Right. And, and, yeah, we will give you that. Yeah, and, and with everything that we, with fund balances going over and projects that weren't, you know, things that are coming in, sometimes the distinction of, Yes, we have a $316 million proposed budget, but in the end, again, we're not done with 2017. Right. You know, the actual budget that we end up pr approving throughout the entire year is over that amount. So right. This is our starting point, and uh, anything from 2017 that isn't completed, we will uh, bring to you during 18 for an additional appropriation, any new revenue, particularly from grants, uh, and also particularly CDBG DR revenues, which we do not budget right. in the, our, our original budget, but is a significant amount of dollars that come from year to year. Those are all additions to the original budgets. So you have that number yet? Yeah. What you got, Teresa? $136.4 million is what the 2017 budget is currently. So, so far. So far, right. Currently. <laughs> what was that? 436 million is that correct so but again with things coming in you know uh, DR fun, you know, funds uh, fund balances things that weren't uh, were paid for in 2016 to 17 I mean it's an ongoing it's probably a good idea uh, to remind us of that when those uh, additional appropriations come through the year and I know it does say that only in council communi council communication here's what our budget is here's what it's going to be after you uh, approve this supplemental budget uh, supplemental appropriation, but you know, it, it might be good. That, uh, you know, it's a small distinction to go between what was the proposed budget, and what we approved for 17, to what is going to be proposed for 18. 
right? Mayor Coombs, members of council, actually I think there's an attachment to every one of our appropriations that will show you our, our beginning balances uh, in one column and our additional appropriations year to date and then the ordinance that you're considering for an appropriation at that time and then what our, our ending or current ending balance is for that point in the year. And those are always helpful. It's always just when we get to that, 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 like at this point with the proposed budget, you know, it's always good to know where are we right now in 17 as, as opposed to where what, what's being proposed, again, minus those other things that are coming in. It's we also, sorry. 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 But we also do maintain now a, a running um, total, uh, not just total, but detail on all of those operations throughout the year. Is it available on the web page now? So if the citizens want to go in and actually see what has been made up, that difference between the original budget of 282 million and 436 million, all that detail is always available. Okay. So the proposed budget does include uh, water fee increases of 9% that the council has approved previously. Uh, there are sewer fee increases that you just recently discussed at a 3% increase. They're not a part of the uh, proposed budget at this time. We weren't as recent as that was. We we're not able to include that in the proposed budget, but between um, the proposed and the final, so there's your first additional appropriation, right? But there will be some additions uh, to the budget such as that that we will bring to you. Uh, other fee increases being proposed in recreation, uh, we have them uh, for admission and fee passes of a 10% increase, and all other rec fees and charges are going to increase 5%. And there's also a uh, variety of changes in the Union Reservoir fee schedule. You will get more detail on those in the coming weeks. The budget includes uh, growth in property and sales tax as uh, uh, really the primary drivers of the increase in, in the revenue in the city's general fund. Uh, it's a 7.17% increase in total general fund ongoing revenue. About 85% of that is from growth in sales tax and property tax. We have development revenue based on projections of 995 dwelling unit permits. Compared to for this year, there were 1,009 projected. We have a 6.74% increase in sales and use tax projected for this year, 2017. And then on top of that, we are projecting 1.77% growth in 18. Uh, through uh, June, we've had growth of 13.3% in sales tax and 26.2% in use tax, so has been strong, but we do expect that that's gonna taper off in the second half of the year. Uh, as far as you'll be, also tonight, you received the uh, proposed pay plan with the budget, and we'll be hearing more about the details on that next week, but some of the highlights are, we uh, have pay increases in accordance with our policy to strive to pay prevailing market wages. We're recommending a, um, 1.7% increase in pay ranges. Uh, we're recommending budgeting pay at 101% of market. We talked to the council about that in previous years about our, our desire to change our goal of budgeting from at 100% to 102%. We're able to uh, afford a 1% increase in that in, in this 2000. Councilmember Bagley, you have to ask a question? Mayor, just real quick, what, uh, it just dawned on me, what, are we, what source are we using to determine market? We use a variety of source of surveys from uh, different uh, areas. We have mostly from the sur surveys from Colorado Municipal League and the Mountain States Employer Council, but then there's also a lot of uh, uh, individual surveys for different uh, employee groups. Uh, like in specialized areas that are also utilized. Is the Mountain States Employer Council nonprofit or everybody? It is a combination of both public and private. I was just curious, thank you. Right. And you'll hear <coughs> more detail on that next week. <coughs> um, also includes funding of, of 2%. Uh, we uh, previously were at 1%, but we're increasing that to 2% of pay to reward employees for delivering extraordinary performance. Uh, and that allows for uh, pay in the open range between a 101% and 108% of the range midpoint. Um, we have 
collective bargaining increases of 3% for police and 2.5% for fire. An average 1.7% uh, increase in step positions for uh, LPC. Open range positions uh, at, at, for employees at currently at market midpoint, they would receive a 2.7% increase if they're continuing to meet expectations. That's from the 1.7% increase in the range and then the then paying at 101 is an extra 1% on top of that. Have an up to 5% increase for employees that are being paid below market currently, and then a one-time payment of 2.7% of base salary, or um, that's a at a max of $1,500 for any employees that are above market, but only due to market decreases. I wanted to back up because I missed when I was going through the revenue here. I talked about the sales tax and I left off the property tax and I just noticed that an hour ago and I made a note but I just skipped right over it. The property tax increase is budgeted at 15.1 percent in the proposed budget. As in the past, uh, we do not receive our, our property tax valuations and these are uh, current, the most current preliminary but still preliminary valuations. Uh, we don't receive those until uh, just today actually, I just received them uh, this morning. And so it kind of makes it hard for us to put together a proposed budget, but unfortunately our, our charter deadlines for proposing a budget don't really align very well with the state deadlines for getting this information out for the uh, assessor's office. So we did put together, based on the earliest information they provided to us, uh, a budget based on some preliminary estimates. We were not going to budget as much as they were uh, identifying at that point in time because we're afraid that with appeals that could only go downwards. It can still go downward based on appeals. Appeals are continuing to be um, accepted through, I believe, the middle of next month. And then we will not get our final assessed valuations until late November after you've already uh, adopted a, a budget for 2018. So we will be talking about property tax uh, in a couple of weeks and the revenues that we received, but we did receive at least, you know, it was good to get that information today and know that we didn't over budget the property tax. So we will bring to you uh, more information on uh, the property tax from the general fund and also for the um, general improvement district and the DDA who are also in similar situations. So this budget includes 17.65 new FTE Three and a half of those FTE are funded uh, either as one-time expenses or fixed-term type positions uh, <coughs> tied to different projects or efforts or um, special funding like incremental development revenue. 12.9 of the FTE are in the general fund. Uh, one of them is in the public safety fund. Uh, the remaining 3.75 are in public works and natural resources funds uh, spread out allocated over a number of these funds, water fund, streets fund, and then sewer, sanitation, storm drainage, and open space. So those are 3.75 FTE allocated across those funds. The positions themselves, uh, what I have the information here is uh, giving you uh, which positions are, are being added. There is more detail in the bu budget message about the use or, or need for each of these positions. Uh, I did where this is asterisk is, is identifying those positions that are, are funded through one-time revenues or, or uh, incremental development revenue. Uh, we have a quarter FTE admin analyst in uh, enterprise technology services. Also one FTE billing system technical project manager in ETS and one FTE systems administrator one in ETS and a FTE project manager one in ETS. Uh, some of those, those first two positions are tied to our um, uh, CIS project uh, and they're, so they are, uh, they're actually all tied to different uh, efforts but they're all new systems that will be uh, purchased and, and or, or identified and begun to work on in 2018. They have an admin analyst in public safety and courts and one customer service rep in utility billing. 
We have a digital media specialist in the city manager's office, a half FTE administrative assistant in the city attorney's office, actually in the city prosecutor's area, 0.15 FTE assistant curator in, in the museum, uh, quarter FTE registrar in the museum. This position is a, um, um, is a one time type position for uh, moving um, the equipment into the new collections facility or I should say not the equipment, but the collection into the collections facility. We have one FTE community services project coordinator in community services and a public relations and marketing, marketing specialist in community services. One FTE code enforcement inspector. And then we have one FTE fire protection engineer. That one is being funded with incremental development revenue. And a communication specialist in public safety actually out of the public safety fund. And then one FTE um, yeah, EAV Arborist Technician in Public Works Natural Resources uh, funded with um, uh, tree mitigation revenues. And then we have a half Economic Sustainability Coordinator in Public Works Natural Resources and a half Project Manager 2 in Public Works Natural Resources. Half FTE Volunteer Coordinator in Public Works Natural Resources, half Lab Tech half FTE lab technician, half FTE neighborhood resources specialist, and one FTE water utility tech lead, and finally one FTE traffic signal two, all in public works and natural resources. So we did use uh, priority based budgeting in evaluating all of our requests. Council Member Moore, did you want to ask a question now? Yeah, um, so if how many total, I missed that first part of it, how many total are being added? 17.65 is the total new FTE. Okay, we have homes for all those individuals? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I think in general, we probably have homes for most of these positions. Um, so, so Meaning uh, office space or workspace? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yes, I think we do um, in what we were seeing. If you look at it, a number of them are actually um, can you go back? Field, field workers, yeah. a number of them, okay. most of them work in the field. Um, and, and as you remember, when we talked a little bit about this earlier, and we were hearing comments about things like code enforcement and those issues and where we are in the development cycle, um, and I indicated this was going to be really probably a heavier year in terms of these positions. It's really managing the work cycle that we're seeing develop and what we're having to do. And, and in some ways, the expansion of programs. If you look at the position in community service, you know, what we're really finding is, is when you look at the issues related to homelessness, affordable housing, we really have Karen and Kathy <coughs> doing the majority of that work. And so what we're really trying to do is to balance that out so we have more capability to respond um, in a more timely manner and deal with some of these issues. Yeah, I just want to make sure that we're able to house or have a place for them to work efficiently and effectively. I mean, I guess we could give up the council chambers, but <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 it's always a concern of I have when we start right. putting a lot of people on board. So I'm going to come back to that issue though in a, in a minute. Also, Mayor Finley, we'll slides. So. I also have a, a question about FTEs. From everything that I hear, we need some more FTEs over at the Planning and Development Services, and I don't see any increases there. <laughs> So the one, so the one that you saw is the um, fire inspection, and that's a, an additional inspector, in terms of the the um, reviewing the plan, plan review. the plan review for that, and so that's there. Can you go back to the list? Uh, fire protection engineer. Can't remember. There were some others that we put in in terms of contract cost, overtime cost. Um, basically that were submitted by that department in terms of the request to deal with those issues. The other thing that we did, if you may remember in the last budget, we added some additional positions there. Um, so I want to say that in terms of the request coming from development services, we filled the majority of the requests they made to us in terms of staffing levels. But it shows yeah. itself in different ways, I think. Mayor Coomins, Council Member Finley, we uh, we did have some additional uh, incremental development revenue 
And so uh, we actually uh, did sit, sit down with uh, Joni Marsh and ask her, so where would this best be put towards if we were able to fund an additional position from that and in order to uh, facilitate that development review process? And the fire protection engineer was where they said they needed the most help. So and that's, that's why that is what we funded. Yeah, we'll, so uh, going back to the priority-based budgeting, we did uh, use that to evaluate all of our requests in this budget. Uh, we have $14.35 million that are funded in the 2018 budget. Um, that is uh, broken down into the quartiles in this area, $9.28 million in quartile one, which is 64.7%. Almost three million in quartile two at twenty percent, one point six four million in quartile three, or which is eleven percent, and then four hundred eighty six thousand in quartile four. So that's this again is just the request that we received. It doesn't include uh, any addition, any salary and benefits in, increased in the in the budget. Uh, those these we're only able to actually categorize by service at this point in time. Um, <coughs> The, the requests that we actually have received that are level one, level two type requests or one-time expenses uh, as opposed to salary and benefits. So we will be giving you more information on how the budget breaks down in, in, uh, into more detailed areas by these quartiles as well in uh, upcoming meetings. So if you look at our budget message, it does categorize the new budget resources based on the council's desired results under the priority-based budgeting, which is a safe community, a thriving economic climate, uh, vibrant amenities and opportunities for all, reliable, innovative, and resilient infrastructure, and responsive internal operations and governance. So there's a total of a million dollars of general fund ongoing resources now being transferred to the Affordable Housing Fund to continue efforts to capitalize that fund. Uh, there's an increase of $460,000 of ongoing resources being proposed in the 18 budget. Uh, so that's an increase of the amount that we have currently going in there of 540000 in 2017. Yeah, I want to... You know, so recently I had some folks ask, well, this is one-time dollars. The money that we have been putting into the affordable housing fund has been ongoing dollars. What we're adding will be ongoing dollars. So this will be a million ongoing in the budget. And, and so I wanted to make that clear because I think there's, a, there's been a misunderstanding in terms of they just think it's a one-time injection. This is going to continue until council directs us to do something differently in the budget. So the highlights of the budget is that, uh, you know, after, I think when the city manager first started, pretty much we said to him, hey, look at this budget, you know, so we had some issues that we had to resolve in the budget five years ago or so with a budget, we, consider, we called it a budget reset gap. So this 2018 proposed budget eliminates um, or gets rid of that reset gap that we've been carrying. We had about, we estimated about $300,000 left coming into this budget. We did a couple of moves that uh, eliminates uh, those type of um, identified uh, reset issues. We will continue to make improvements in the general fund budget or the overall budget as well that will continue to probably tighten up these things into the future uh, to build a better, more sustainable general fund budget. But uh, we are happy to say that we've eliminated that, that gap. That started out at what, $3 million? Yeah, well, it started at $3 million, and it's kind of like as we pushed, as we brought it down, it was growing up right. as well. And we continue to throw things in there into the reset, saying, yeah, what about that? That's a reset item. Councilmember Bagley? Thank you, Mary Coombs. Uh, five and a half years ago, when I first saw the budget reset term, or heard that term, and saw the amount, and saw every year as we do the budget, that you guys are working towards eliminating it, and it was always a you know, 15, 20 minute presentation. And so just I didn't want it to go without recognition and gratitude and saying good job that, uh, I mean, this was a 30 second, like, oh yeah, the general budget reset gap is eliminated, and good job. 
so that that is noticed. We're glad to get out of the way. Plus, I I always spell reset as rest, so I'm glad to get it <laughs> out of the way, so I don't have to do that anymore. So, um, other things we've done, we've increased some funding to the general employees retirement plan. We're still trying to reduce the unfunded liability over there. None of that's going to take place overnight, but we are trying to strengthen it to move it towards full funding. We've added staffing to implement the sustainability plan, and we are uh, putting some dollars towards funding the emergency warning system. Uh, the proposed budget includes an increase in the emergency reserves of a million dollars for the general fund fund balance this year. It's going to raise our reserve that's committed to emergencies to 7.5%, or just below $10 million. Uh, the goal is for us to have an 8% emergency reserve. We we've also been chasing that over time, probably the last five or six more years. And uh, this is the largest amount that we've moved towards that fund. This is all one-time money. This is not ongoing money. And um, uh, we're, you know, we're, it, it gets higher and higher because the percentage is always the same, but the size of the fund increases. So it's Harder to catch it, so we're, we're making a, uh, an effort here, but $10 million of an of a emergency reserve is, is not a bad place to be, so feel good about that. Um, public safety uh, tax increase is not included within the proposed budget. I have some references to it in the budget message. Uh, we assume that uh, we will bring that to you in the coming month to discuss anyway with a proposed budget if the voters were to approve it. It's a um, $5.19 million um, revenue increase in 2018. would fund 20 new FTE and over $2.2 .2 million of, of one-time expenses for 2018. And then in the following years, another seven more FTE, $1.8 million for one-time expenses in 19. 16 more FTE in the third year, $1.2 million of one-time expenses, and then it'll level off to $700,000 a year of one-time expenses. 43 FTE over three years. I am not going to tell you we have homes for them. So uh, I think we brought that up already, and, and uh, it is an issue that uh, probably needs to be considered, but this public safety t tax does not uh, take care of expanding uh, or additional um, quarters or building for the uh, uh, public safety FTE. If, if council may remember when we talked about the public safety tax, one of the things that we indicated is that the, the facility space study uh, for the public safety building was um, 10 years old? 10 or 20, 20 years, years old. Yeah. And so what, what we indicated as we talked about this is that we need to really redo that and evaluate how we approach it. Um, when we looked at the cost, one of the major components of that was a parking garage, and we think that there's some other options that we can look at to, to really help us manage that more efficiently. Um, so that is part of the work, um, should this pass, that we're going to have to undertake to really start evaluating that. Again, um, you know, it's evaluating space, and um, what we're finding from an office standpoint is that in some cases, when you can do it, the open space environment is actually more conducive to good work, and so we'll be looking at a number of things. So, uh, just real quickly going through a calendar of presentations, uh, and there probably are some things I've left off here as I think about it. I, I, this is just what I put in the budget message, but there'll probably be more things added in that you'll want to hear more about. So. On September 5th next week, we will be discussing employee compensation and benefits, and then we will be looking at the CIP, including the uh, status of the Public Improvement Fund, which has had some changes, as you were aware from earlier this year, that we've had to work into the, into the five-year CIP. On the 12th, which is a regular meeting, we will just limit it to a uh, budget summary for the General Fund and the Public Safety Fund. Uh, and probably an overall budget summary as well will give you a little bit more detail on the uh, changes in individual funds. On the 19th, on priority based budgeting, we'll go through uh, more detail on what we showed you already uh, by uh, individual fund as far as um, the quartiles that these budget increases are, are tied to. Uh, we'll talk about affordable housing, one-time expenses, 
our uses for incremental development revenue for 2018, a little bit about the airport fund, and uh, also still um, on the 19th we'll be going through the fee increases that I mentioned earlier, talk about the use of the property tax, uh, the public safety fund budget for the proposed tax, and also the potential use of the proposed marijuana tax uh, for the other half of that that has not been uh, designated, which first half for affordable housing so and then finally on the 26th we'll review financial policies and uh, the budget for the LDDA funds and you hold your first public hearing on the 26th and then on the third the second public hearing we'll be looking for final direction on that evening and then the ordinances and resolutions uh, October 10th and 24th <coughs> so that's it I just wanted to uh, acknowledge the effort uh, of, of Teresa Malloy and her staff. Um, we have, uh, Teresa's, you know, like, works three full-time jobs anymore, it seems like, but she's uh, manager for the HATS project, and we are really in the middle of a, the toughest part of our phase two of, of the HATS project, so hardly get to see her anyway at this time of year, but somehow she pulls all that off and coordinates it with her staff, uh, which is Melody Polaro and um, Sandra Cifuentes, and they've done a great job of putting this budget together, and we literally uh, are finished it off just two hours ago as far as finish editing the budget message and getting the information ready for you. So it seems like no matter when we schedule it to, we don't get it done until two hours before this meeting. So. Well, and, oh, uh, Jim, Jim's a, in a, an amazing part of this, and he has to put up with me going, what's the revenue estimates, what's the revenue estimates, and... And then when we get into the budget hearings and making the decisions, and, um, Jim's a great part of this, and he does an awesome job. And, and frankly, he, he gives he gives me the information I need to move through things. And at times, he's hounding me <laughs> to to get it in. So I uh, I want to give credit to Jim and the work that he does because uh, it's amazing. So it is a constantly changing process for us, and we hate that because we want it to, you know, just be at a certain point where it stops, and we can just get something to you that is, is final. Uh, we already know that we are going to bring to you property tax changes. We already know that we uh, made a, we found uh, an oversight in what we were. It's not going to change uh, any expenses in the budget, but it's going to change some numbers around in the budget, in one of our budget reset items that we. Uh, uh, fail to correct in the right means. So we're going to, we are, we have a change that's proposed that's already going to go in there that is not major, but those type of changes or anything addition that you give us direction on, we'll just continue to keep track of those, compile them, summarize them for you on the third, and you can give us the final direction at that point, and then we'll prepare the ordinances for the 10th to, for consideration. So. Council Member Bagley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Could you go back one slide? Sure. Are you please? One more slide. Okay. So the just just to get clarity, the million dollars that is ongoing in the annual budget for uh, affordable housing, that was go back. There it is. One more no, forward. One where it more says no nope, on September 9th, potential use of the proposed marijuana tax. That one million dollars that was budgeted and planned for, and that does not even include the marijuana tax. Right. We also Right? So that's been in there. Right. That's correct. So just, there's a million dollars in the budget for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's be in excess of a million if you included that 1.5%. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Which, which was roughly estimated, if the estimates were anywhere close, would be about $145,000, I think. Thank you. So I wanted to answer Councilmember Finley's question. So when I looked at the request coming in, I think we... we we funded the requests that were made by development services. Part of what's in there um, that really got at some of this was in a cost for landscape architect, which is part of the review. They do it's a contracted part of the review. Um, other other pieces of that were um, over time for in-house plan review because we felt like that could also allow us to move through processes more quickly. Um, in, in addition to what we added last year, and I think we added mid-year some positions too, didn't we? Uh, Last year we did it, yeah, mid-year, and then we finalized them in, in, the, in the 17 budget. In the 17 so. budget. One of the things that we're trying to be careful with is we always want to be cognizant of the fact that the, this activity is cyclical. And so when you add positions, 
what we've trained to, what we've tended to try to do is add term positions because we know at some point the workload is going to shift in the other direction. So. And with it, the revenue, so that's the incremental development revenue that supports most of those requests that, that Harold just identified. And that we'll cover those on the 19th. Councilmember Christensen. Thanks for a very clear presentation <coughs> and all of your hard work up until 7 o'clock today. <laughs> um, so will the, um, the budget actually be posted tomorrow in our drop boxes or on the city Please. site? Tonight? Should be there tonight. Okay. Oh boy. Bedtime reading. Okay, thank you. Night reading. Got it. <laughs> Get on it right away. Council Member. Finley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I do understand that, that uh, the cyclical nature, but I've been on council for six years, and I've had people tell me for six years now that it takes too long to get through, and we're still in that cycle, so I'd like to do whatever we can <coughs> to help that. Okay, I don't see any, any further questions. Good job. <laughs> so now, now it's time for uh, mayor and council comments. <laughs> Councilmember Santos. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. As we're all aware, uh, the Texas Gulf Coast and now Louisiana are getting battered by tropical storm Harvey. So as it was several years ago when we had our own flood, we got uh, a lot of help from out of state. Um, from other other states as well. So I would hope that and encourage folks to donate to the American Red Cross or the, um, or the Salvation Army to help those folks that have lost quite a bit, um, who may still lose quite a bit due to uh, uh, releasing of water from dams in the, uh, in the Houston area. Luckily, you know, knock on wood, uh, members of my family, except for maybe one, uh, may uh, be out of the may be out of the water's way. So, but there are others. I see Facebook posts of friends who've lost everything. So, um, as we as we as those folks rallied around us several years ago, I'd hope we'd rally around those individuals that need help. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I would like to echo what Councilman Santos said, but also to uh, ask you to be wary of scams. I remember during Katrina when there were uh, Salvation Army donations, there were phony Salvation Army sites up. So um, perhaps if you have any questions about that, you could go to local uh, TV stations and look at their list of uh, reliable, verified places you can donate. Well, I'd like to point out that the uh, Nepalese community is going to have a universal peace uh, event at the Senior Center on the uh, 9th of um, September at 11 o'clock. And what this peace poll is, is basically a square poll that has eight different languages, two languages on a side that just promote peace. And uh, so anyway, that's uh, happening then. And you know, ultimately they're looking to have a permanent home to donate that, this to the city. And so, uh, you know, so Potentially working that problem. One thing that uh, you know, I was brainstorming with the uh, Rata Maker yesterday during the tour. Perhaps uh, you know, you've got the Katamoto Park, that's um, where we have the Tower of Compassion, a peace theme there, and the fact that this has both Spanish and uh, Japanese on it, so it ties into our uh, sister city. Uh, you know, so per perhaps something, you know, it, it's real simple. It's just like a pole. You just plant it like a postal. So there's no maintenance to it. It's there's no it's weaterproof. There's no cost, and it's going to be done. So anyway, we're just you know, starting the process of figuring out where we might want to find a permanent. Home. So I just wanted to make council aware of that. So that's I'm not giving any direction or making any decisions. I just I say that's something that's happening. I've got a picture if anybody wants to see what it looks like. So. All right, uh, any other comments? Okay, city manager, any remarks? 
Uh, uh, just a couple. Um, Dale just sent me something. So um, one of the things that's interesting, one of our own local um, businesses, Oscar Blues, um, is sending um, 88,000 um, cans of water um, to, to the impacted area. And, and so that's really you know, good to see where businesses are coming in. In terms of what Council Member Peck said, as you can also look at that, or you can also go in and um, just from my experience being in there, sometimes you could look into the um, state's um, emergency operation website, and they'll also list um, do um, groups that you can <coughs> donate to that are directly um, serving those impacted um, um, in an event. And so that's just another area. But um, be wary of that as a community because too many times in these cases I've seen it where folks come out and actually um, present that there's someone else and, and they end up taking the money and it doesn't go to the disaster. So um, definitely look at news media sources, but if you need to, you can go into the state sources and they'll identify those locations. Council Member Santos? Uh, and real quickly also, just you know, if you want to give a part of yourself, donate blood. Their um, uh, blood banks are low in Texas. Okay. Um, city Attorney, any remarks? No comments, Mayor. Okay, this meeting is adjourned.